into the inner verse. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. I'm your host, Chance Garten. And as Aries season continues to drive us forward in the expansion of life on the realm, we curious souls can find a similar explosion of spiritual energy available to propel our perspective past the previous thresholds of our awareness. Like many previous shows on this channel have done, we are once again asking the most profound questions of life and fueling the evolution of that singular life fractal through our inquiries. Why is our world the way it is? What are we doing in it? And just what is all this time stuff marching us towards in the end? Just as many ceramic pieces of different shapes and sizes can all emerge from the same potter's wheel and clay, the perfect pattern of creation and the living prima materia that it molds are the father and mother of all things that exist. It's no surprise then, that the primal parents of creation are called pater and matter, pattern and material, or that the Egyptians conceived of this evolutionary framework as a potter spinning his wheel, named Ptah. The highest value in all spiritual pursuits or metaphysical speculations is in harnessing nature's organizing principle and doing our best to align our behaviors and endeavors with its wisdom. And to do that, we constantly seek to refine our comprehension of the many philosophical schools of thought into a syncretized system that reflects the natural world and its mathematical order of operations. This is what I call universal truth. And as fortune, as fortune would have it for us true seekers of wisdom, today's guest has been on the very same quest as our intrepid Interverse family, and he's here to reveal some of the keys to that cosmic order which have emerged out of harmonizing his various fields of study. Along with fellow polymath Robert Edward Grant, Robert Comer is part of a team of math magicians blending the various fields of science and spirituality, and he's also the author of the upcoming book, The Lost Octave, a 400-plus page compendium of astrotheology, sacred geometry, mystical mathematics, and perspectives that bridge the observations of modern science to the knowledge of ancient mystery traditions. Most fascinating to me is the tantalizing teases Rob has given out about his intuitive leap forward in understanding what is possibly the world's oldest divination framework, the I Ching, which seeks to bridge the gap between the precessional number of 72 with the 64-bit code of DNA and the I Ching hexagrams. Although I haven't read the book yet, because it's not out until May, the enticing implications Rob has elucidated on his site connecting star lore, hypercubes, a higher octave of life, the master key to the I Ching, the mysteries of the king's chamber in the Giza pyramid, and much more, all sound like fascinating pieces of the puzzle of our existence, and I can't wait to see how they might fit together. You can pre-order Rob's book at thelostoctave.com, and you'll find that along with all the ways you can support Interverse linked in the episode description. I'm super stoked to open up this conversation, so let's all give a warm psychic welcome to the initiator of the next I Ching interval and hypercube hype man himself, Rob Comer. Thanks for being here and welcome to Interverse. Wow, that's uh, quite an introduction. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for um, having me on. And yeah, I, I'd love to dive really deep into all of this. And it's such a fascinating and rich subject. And, you know, these things that you know, I've been blessed enough to to find and discover and bring forward. Uh, you know, they they really are here to help shape. You know, this this movement forward in in many many different 
sort of subjects, many different areas of life, and ultimately so that we can know ourselves more moving through this great cosmic plan. Amen to that, brother. And uh, I always kind of want to know where where did it all start for you? And what was the, the straw that broke the camel's back and you started looking at life differently and opening up to a, a more connected version of it? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And obviously it's been a, a quite a interesting, fairly quick road, I would say. Like I, I, I had a kind of a fairly instantaneous, spontaneous awakening, um, you know, where I, I literally just attended seven years ago. Uh, I was working in a, in a gym as you do, completely different life, completely different version of myself, completely unaware of any kind of this stuff. And so seven years ago, you know, I was, there was a, a, an advertisement for a yoga session to go into a yoga session. Of course, it was kind of this trend to sort of, you know, it was getting into fashion and into gyms and things. And so it was really there that really, for the first time, I was told to close my eyes whilst it was daytime which was the most bizarre thing that I'd ever experienced in my life because well, why, in my head, it was like, well, why would you close your eyes when you're not sleeping? I just never, it just never computed to me. And so literally in that moment of closing my eyes, it was like, I just entered and I actually was, I ended up in space. And so it literally was like, this is really strange. You know, and so from that experience, when I opened my eyes and everybody else is sort of in this meditating uh, realm, I could start seeing these golden wheels above everybody's heads. And I, I really thought I was having this weird hallucination. <laughs> it was like I must have been working too hard that day or something, you know. And that was really I basically was seeing the chakra system, which I knew, you know, which I know now. And so from that, really, the yoga teacher said to me, you know, if anybody's got any questions you know speak to me afterwards and then so that's really what catapulted me into it and i started to learn about what chakras are what you know what this meditation thing was all about and so that's really how it just morphed it into like this it, there was nothing else in my life that was more important than this than to learn this and to figure out what this was and obviously I had no context, no friends that had gone through this, no, no mentors, no. It was, so it was all just you're on your own at night thinking I'm going to try and shut my eyes again and see what happens again. And I was, it was very shamanic at the beginning for me. You know, it was like I was going on sort of kind of cosmic adventures. I had these feelings of leaving my body and, you know, kind of the, those sort of usual astral projection type things and, you know, dreams were more vivid. And so... I had just no idea what was happening to me at that point. So that's really kind of the the very core of, of, of how it sort of started. Man, I'm glad I asked that question. What a cool story. I kind of yeah. relate to that in the sense that I went from normal to full blown, like having all this knowing sort of shamanic awakening experience and had skills and like energy manipulation abilities far beyond my pay grade as a person 23 years old. And then it all kind of died down a bit as I had to go lay the groundwork of, uh, you know, doing the work on my health, doing the work on my awareness, doing the work to shift the circumstances of my external life. And uh, eventually I caught up to where I was at in that breakthrough like year and it's interesting because it was sort of like I was getting a preview of who I was going to become so that I would know what direction to, you know, steer my ship towards. And I'm wondering if it's been like that for you over the last seven years, if, if, uh, you know, you find yourself sort of building up the foundations, what I, the joke I would always make to myself, I don't know if I ever said this to anybody about why I found shamanism and shamanistic practices like uh, journey work so valuable and interesting was that like the piece it gave me was, I think I heard you say something similar in a, in a podcast interview that I felt like I had read the last page of the book and now I'm going back to where I was in the, in the story, but with the knowledge of like, Oh, it's all going to be fine. It's going to be great. Yeah, no, beautiful. And yeah, because in the book I reveal what I call the law of octaves. And so, you know, this has kind of been, you know, people speak about octaves and, and, and really I've noticed on, you know, within the, even in the last few months, that word is just so present and people that don't even know about this book yet are, you know, speaking about, Oh, we feel like we're going to another octave. 
Um, but yeah, going back to, for me, obviously everything falls apart at the same time as everything falls together. And so, you know, there's this real weird, almost seeming conflicting understanding of the outside world and the inside world. And of course, when you don't have a guide or any, you know, any sort of person to understand, and I'd never read any of these books, I never knew anything about anything. So for me, it was just purely raw, which is obviously, which was the beauty of my journey, because I, I had to learn quick. You know, it was almost like downloading in a way from the universe, like every night to try and figure out what is happening. Um, and so that's what put me into, you know, looking outwards to try and find courses. And then that's when I went on to as many courses as I could kind of afford and, and learn that I was interested in because, you know, I'd seen, started to see sort of angelic beings and galactic beings. And I'm like, what is this? So I saw this angelic Reiki course, you know, like the typical sort of, you know, so I went and I did all of those and and I did crystal healing and I learned about all these. And so all of this started to build up the library that was really confirming. It was really confirming what I was experiencing. So I had some sort of like, OK, this is kind of normal. Like this is actually, you know, a process. Um, and so, yeah, that that disillusion of the of the external world is really difficult because that's really where that you have that real those troubles of that sort of almost dark night of the soul which i did have which was i actually had two of them which were really uh yeah they are they are so tough really really tough and so but it, it really is that collapsing of everything that you've ever thought or believed to be true about yourself and about the world and then this sort of uh you, you love it because it's truth is coming out but it's also painful it is like growing pains and so that's really where I fell in love with mostly the chakra system. And I was experiencing more chakras as from what I was reading, I was experiencing more than just what I could read about. And so then I had to go right back into the tantric texts. And that's what I love the most, you know, the original tantric texts and the Vedas and uh, Upanishads. And, you know, that was my love affair that I had. Um, and that really brought me into being able to understand how to work with them and, and move into them and unlock them. Oh man, that's a, a really interesting subject too. My, myself, I do a energy work called biofield tuning, but I started out just with intuitive, like Reiki abilities, playing with crystals. The crystals were what gave me my first hit of, Oh, I can feel something non-physical here that has an effect. I remember you, like waving selenite sticks around people's heads who had a headache and they said their headache went away and like, what, what is this? It totally is a paradigm changer. Uh, and there's a few things you brought up there that I really want to talk about, but maybe I think the, the most interesting would be the law of octaves. So what is that by your understanding and how you talk about it in your upcoming book? Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a huge kind of um, thing that I really want to write about in detail after the book because it's it's almost like it's a, it's a, its own sort of you know there's been things about like the law of one and you know all these kind of uh the hermetic laws and to really get the best out of it is to i want i want to go into it fully but essentially it's this understanding of within this book it's it's understanding the pole shift of what's really what happens on the earth and what we're going to be going through as a collective consciousness for this divine timing but it's also the inner pole shift you know there's been most of the texts that we that we read about from the ancients it's ascension you know it's all about going up through the chakra system and that's really how i learned you know it's like oh if, if you hit the third eye and then you go into the crown and you go into the next 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 and it's always going out and that's really in a way kind of very a masculine kind of ascension path Whereas the descension, obviously embodiment path, and that's really the key word of our time is, you know, embodiment, embodiment, because we're trying now to pull that light into the physical form. So it's not so much astral projecting out. It's actually about trying to pull that light in. And of course, if the body's full of density, it's, a, it's harder to pull that light in. So the law of octaves is basically saying that the easiest way is, you know, because I had to learn music also for this book. Uh, and, and that's why I say that I want to make this so accessible for people that you can learn all of this stuff pretty quickly, pretty easily, because the first note, whatever note it is on a piano, when you go, 
when you move up eight notes, the eighth note is the end of that octave, but it's also the beginning of the next, which was a really profound it's a really profound thing when you start to look at music. And that's why I feel a lot of musicians, they normally have a lot of deeper insight into a whole load of aspects of consciousness as well. And I think that's why it touches us more because they understand with perhaps without knowing that this sense of the beginning note is the same note as the end note, just in a higher octave. And of course you can go down in octaves as well. So this understanding that, hold on a minute, maybe it's spherical. You know, that maybe rather than just linear of this note to this note, it's actually it bends back on itself and it actually is the same thing, which starts to expand the mind that we're actually in a spherical consciousness, a spherical time space rather than this 3D-ness of from here to there. And so that's why I say that that means then that when we are incarnated on the earth as a consciousness, feeling that we, we, we need to get to the end goal, that end goal is already here. We started with it because the end and the beginning is the same. And so what the book is trying to show people is that, you know, it's an age old thing of like, it's all within you. And that's easy to say, but the book is showing you before you embark on your journey, if you understood that this was part of your story, you know, it, it doesn't make it any less beautiful. It actually makes it more beautiful because you understand where you're meant to go to fulfill your 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 star law, to fulfill what your blueprint is. And, you know, how you do it is is the beauty. That's the freedom of the creativity, the free will. You know, it's like you're going to create this beautiful art piece. But what paints you use, acrylic or oils, it doesn't matter. Is that that is your choice. And so when you know that at the beginning, you know, if I knew that at the beginning of my journey, you know, it would actually allow me to relax into it more and allow me to learn more and be more receptive, which is the feminine. Whereas when we're trying to pursue, I'm seeking, I'm seeking, I'm seeking. We often miss, we, we walk past, you know, it's like the glasses you're trying to find, you know, trying to find my glasses and they're on your head, you know, because you're so determined in your focus of, of seeking. And so this is where the beauty of the feminine is now saying, you can just relax, sit back, know your story gives you the opportunity to move through it with that relaxation in the body, calming the nervous senses, nervous system down, allowing you to integrate the light into the form. And that's really the law of octaves. You know the beginning. The beginning is the end, and the end is the beginning. That is the, literally the key sentence of the law of octaves. The beginning is the end, and the end is the beginning, uh, which really relates to parts of the I Ching, which we'll get into, which is the final two hexagrams is before completion and after completion. And so through the law of octaves, I basically uncovered what that riddle really meant. Oh man, can't wait to get into that part. But yeah. the, the, the music, uh, musicality of our cosmos is so clear and obvious that it's uh, a good place it's a good thing that we're going through that it's not in my opinion to keep us down or imprison us or anything the fact that music can exist and naturally exists is is powerful that there's a, a baked in system to it and I, what i like about this octaves idea so much the end of this is the beginning and all that is even outside of a, like a spiritual transformation type quest if people could really perceive and have a, a felt knowing that there's nothing to be afraid of with the end of your, your incarnation or death, that every piece of evidence that you can observe in the entire cosmos is pointing at the fact that that's not the end of you. It's the beginning of you. <laughs> and that you're not going to cease to exist or, or anything like that. It's actually entering into a brand new phase where everything just feels like, ah, relaxed and, and the way that childhood should feel anyway. And I think on the, the larger scale of what's going on in the world, it seems very much like we're due for hitting an octave type of experience as a, as a planet, because it's just like in any, any good musical composition, tensions building, all the drama is happening, but eventually you hit that note that resolves it. And it's like all of that tension and, and dissonance is wiped away instantly when you hit that correct note that completes the octave. It's 
kind of the most magical thing ever yet. It's so simple, you know, and, uh, I really, I really like pondering that. I don't think that there's any limit to the wisdom we can get out of that concept in the small scale of just daily life or the big picture of human, the human collective. Yeah, no. So you picked up on so many amazing points there. Um, and that's why I say the book is so rich. It expanded even in the last month, it expanded another hundred pages because there were so many things that that wanted to come into it that I knew. And I was like, you know, it just, it just had to. So that's why I sort of pushed the date of the release back, but I'm like, it's so worth it because there's just so much in here. And, you know, I could, I probably could have done this in like four volumes, but I wanted to condense it and put it in this one book so that really somebody has got an encyclopedia there, you know, to go through this process. And, you know, even on the back of this, there's multiple courses after this that I've got in the wings, because it's just so much like you're saying with even now contemplating that, you know, this law of octaves, which hasn't been put out there. And, and really the lost octave is the one to bring it out there as a, as a, like a principle of the universe, so to speak, that it's not just about music, it's about consciousness. And so when you were saying about this, um, being relaxed like a child and 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 if we knew this at the beginning really that's the the deep esoteric knowledge of meaning to be born of the lotus you know like to to die before you die you know it's like because when you die you begin again and so then but now you begin again with a new sense of who you really are and so that is the born of the lotus from the the buddhist tradition that is the born again christians that is you know it's 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 all the same things the resurrection it's like the eclipse we had it's like there has to be this final note of that ending but it it's then a beginning of the next and so it's also it's the arc and the the deluge as well like there's many many versions of that metaphor constantly pointing us to exactly what you're saying that uh the destruction and regeneration is a thing that we are central to that we we sort of dictate the experience of that or when we want to initiate that experience. Yeah, there may be larger cosmic cycles that the world goes through that reflect that, but like you said, the die before you die, you can re regain the childlike innocence and wonder at any point and as many times as you want in life, potentially every day if you wanted to. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, when I say, to people who don't know it's like when i say die before you die it's it's not about the physical form necessarily you know it's 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 just the the identity or, or what we believe to be life that collapses and that's the dark night of the soul so that is the the end of an octave but it you can't see it yet but it's the beginning of a new thing and so that's what i mean like when i was going through this if i knew this stuff that I'm expected to have this octave finishing, completing, so then I can actually start a new one, then that's where you can move through that pain and suffering and the release with, with, with joy in your heart, with, a more, with knowing that there's a greater plan for you, rather than thinking that my life is ending. You know? And that's, I think that's the quintessential part of the suffering that this book is trying to, through the feminists, it, it's the mother that's trying to help you through help humanity through help the collective through into that aquarian wisdom uh you know with that softness and with that understanding because you know the sophianic wisdom you know sophia means wisdom and so it's it's the gnosis of sophia that is coming back to birth us literally into that aquarian age but without so many pains as we've had from the aries to piscean age I love it, man. And uh, I wanted to break into talking about the I Ching here because I'm sure that's a huge subject to broach. I'm really fascinated by that mystery you teased in terms of the the last two hexagrams before and after completion. I've used the I Ching as a divinatory tool for, gosh, probably at least 10 or 11 years at this point. And I know a little bit about like the mythology of where it came from. Uh, and some of the more established classical principles that it's based on. But I also find that it's a really 
even though it might look a little scary or uh, complicated from the outside, it's actually a really easy thing to draw your own wisdom and intuition out of without needing to know a lot about it or be educated a lot about it. So could you talk about your uh, perspective on the I Ching, like where it came from, what it is as a way to set up talking about the, the further levels of comprehension that you've unlocked with it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, the thing I want to share with people with this is that, you know, I had a lot of internal rich understandings and, and I went through the chakra systems as I spoke, but when it came to astrology, it, it was actually, I knew parts, but I didn't know hardly anything to what I know now. And the same thing with the I Ching. It, you know, the I Ching really came alive because of the lost octave. I knew parts, like, you know, you see parts in mysticism. And so what I'm trying to say is that it may seem scary and it takes some dedication to look into, but actually you can do this really easily because essentially it is a binary code. And it's, you know, one of the first, you could say, primary binary codes. Um, and they were also doing this in Africa as well, which they found, which in, so they're in Africa, they were doing this binary code, but just in a slightly different way. And so really the I Ching started from, let's say from the fall of you're saying about the the Noah's Ark and the fall, you know, uh, and the fall from Atlantis, you could say. But so when civilization was then popularizing into form again after those cataclysms, then you know the the we needed a way of understanding the seasons. So the you know it's like how do we determine the seasons? How do we understand these elements that we that we experience? I mean, you got to remember these first people were going to be in the wild. And that's where we get the ancient tantras from. They're, they're actually called the forest tantras, which is a shim, is the, the shamanic stuff. So the same thing with the I Ching, you know, they well, how do I understand the water, the rains, the wind, the earth, you know, how do I grow food and how do I keep myself away from danger of the thunder and the storms? So really it's set up as um, understanding the the first eight or the first octave literally the first eight understandings of the seasons so we could understand navigating that and that was really based off of the you know the the flip of the coin so to speak the the yes and no the there's only two answers in a way of that binary system so really that's really where so it it's was really like the all of the ways that yin and yang can interact only the first eight it was the it was a bigram so it's only the it was only two lines so when you start with yin yang and then you have the then you go into bigrams and so really there's only eight possibilities of two lines and that's really where it was and that was about i want to say maybe eight thousand years ago i mean i know that goes against traditional historic understanding but it, I would say it's about 8,000 years ago, that primitive understanding then after the fall. And so really that's really where it was. And so then it kind of got lost over time. Um, and it wasn't really until it was brought back into this understanding um, through royalty that basically they wanted to find out, like, how can we use these this understanding to start to predict things and how do I use it in a way as a divination? And that's where they started to use yarrow sticks, you know? Uh, and so then it morphed over time into using coins, you know, the, the coin flip and which is like probability. And so they're, they're starting to understand probability. And it wasn't really till the King Wen times, which was maybe uh, 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, that then it started to develop into the six lines as hexagrams. And of course, that's when we ended up with the, you know, the I Ching kind of as it is today. And then different people put their spin on it, uh, like Lao Tzu and um, they kind of Confucius put like some philosophy into it. And so it kind of amalgamated into really what we experience uh, today. Um, but yeah, it started all the way back from those sort of primitive yes and no, like two lines in the sand you know, a, a straight line and a broken line. And, you know, essentially it's the understanding of, you know, probability. Um, and so that's how it can be used as a divination, um, which they didn't realize at the time, probably, that was the exact same computer code that we have in our computers today. And I, I love divination a lot because I realized quite a while back that 
there's no such thing as a mistake that the universe makes. So, you know, that li like life never actually makes a mistake. Even things that seem dissonant resolve into something more harmonious than was before eventually given enough time. So even though like the modern take or historians might look back at crazy things like scapulomancy or looking at birds to decide what, what that means for the, the present or even especially astrology, call the thing, these things pseudoscience. Uh, once you comprehend that there is no, the wrong thing never happens. And if you are using a language system to communicate with the universe, well, that universe is intelligent too. That the same spark of consciousness that you're querying it through exists in it and in all things, then that means like you really can have a question and answer session with life. And you could even make up your own ways to get yes or no answers. Or that's why the Oracle deck thing is such a big uh, fad in recent years, because there is something to it. You can really use those things in the proper set and setting and, and with the right sort of uh, respect to the power of the process to get answers. And ultimately the answers tend to be like, what do I really want? <laughs> because that's the biggest question that seems to continually come up for human beings is trying to figure out who am I and what do I really want? And for some reason, that's never quite perfectly clear, except in, in rare moments of, of uh, illumination, perhaps, or after illumination. And we, we decide, I, do, I want that and I stay on course with that. But in terms of um, the I Ching again, do you think that the, the knowledge of it or a similar system was ever outside of Asia? Because I always like to connect it back to this inscription at Heliopolis from supposed to be uh, attributed to Hermes. I am one who becomes two. I am two who becomes four. I am four who becomes eight. I am the one again after that. You know, and I, I, I feel like this concept is, is gotten around the world and our, com our understanding of the connection between ancient civilizations is, is woefully lacking in the mainstream. When, when you study the systems that you and I are interested in, you see, Oh, it's the same thing expressing worldwide. So either there's a universal truth that everyone's tapping into or people are sharing notes or, or I think it's both. Yeah, no, that's, it, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and essentially that's kind of a, an expression you could say of the law of octaves without necessarily saying it, you know, what you just shared. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I was saying about Africa. You know, a lot of people don't know this. And, and the thing is, we don't hear a lot about <laughs> the ancient African tribes, which is kind of mad considering, you know, they're linked to Egypt. And so, you know, a lot of that wisdom is lost. But so they had this binary code and uh, already they had it. They had it probably the same time or, you know, maybe even before the I Ching, you know, but it, how would you know if you're so far away? So each culture i believe had their own system of this it just was described in a different way you know either using sticks or using some kind of code or language or drawings like the aboriginals or everything's really you know in our fingers you know it's all ones you know we count it's it's all counting so it's very kind of primitive way of understanding how the universe works but it actually is a universal master code so in Africa, they have this uh, these African priests, and they basically use shells, and they basically draw lines in the sand. And so they, they'll ask a question, and they, you go to them like an oracle, and you ask a question, and they basically throw these shells like, like you would do rune, casting runes in a way. And of course, the answer would come, and they would draw a, like a line in the sand. And then you ask another question, they throw them again. And, then, and so it builds up like a hexagram pattern. And what I've done through this work is, that foundation that was the African code is actually the code that helped me unlock this into the quantum field. Okay, that's interesting. And go, like, please continue. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, so it's um, it was brought to my attention because um, a, a quantum uh, theorist uh, who was actually the sci head scientist when I think Barack Obama was in uh, was in state. Uh, and Dr. James Gates is his name. And so he he does some really, you know, quantum mathematics is really kind of mind blowing. But he basically found that this this African code 
that he could link to what he was doing. And so basically through the I Ching and through understanding the quantum code that he'd done and the African code, that helped me open up the I Ching into the possibility of moving into the quantum through a similar thing, because it's really just this one language. You know, we see in the matrix, all these numbers running down and everything's ones and zeros. And a lot of people have hypothesized of, are we in, you know, we're in a simulation that's run by ones and zeros. But that's not actually true. It's not that there's ones and zeros. It's just that the simulation we're in can be described as ones and zeros. So it's our it's our simplest language. You know, it's like it's there and it's not there. So how do you do that in the most simplest form that we understand is that we will make it ones and zeros. So it's our language applying it to the to the universe, not that the universe itself is actually a computer code. So I think that often people start thinking, oh, what are we in a matrix? You know, like literally like the film, you know, with these computer codes. And of course, number is part of consciousness, you know, like color is. So you could actually describe the universe as a whole system of colored network, you know, or of light or, or of geometry. All of them are true. It just depends what language you want to express it in. And so that's where I started to realize through the I Ching that this code is a universal code. And it doesn't matter what you substitute zero and one with, you can make it male or female. It doesn't matter what, you know, black or white, it, whatever you want to ascribe it, that is how the universe is. It, it works in those kind of that law of polarity. And so this is how you can start to see that it is universal. And, and that's why in the book, I, I write about the, this is the initiation of ether. Because a lot of people have spoken about the, you know, the earth and the water and the air and the fire and all of those processes. But not many people or anybody that I know of has spoken about the initiation of ether. And this is what we're going through as a consciousness is to understand that if we are the ether, if we if we can experience ourselves as the fifth element, then really there is no boundary to us. We can be everywhere in anything. We can perceive everything. We can understand everything. So it's that complete oneness. And that's really where this where this this book, the understanding of octaves, the understanding of the I Ching, it's pointing us into being universal consciousness, not just a human having an experience. There's so many things I want to respond to about yeah. that, but like even the, the magic of language is constantly revealing what we mean deeper than what we thought we meant just through things like wordplay and puns that come out of our speech. For example, you're talking about the ether, you know, what, what, what I hear out of what you're describing is that we like a, a lot of human beings are now realizing because of this concept, we are not either, or we, we are, we can be either <laughs> ether, either, you know, like with the, the one and the zero, we contain both. And I really like how you described the, and, and rectified people's understanding of simulation theory or computer code. The ancients understood what you're talking about, that there is a, the, the logos concept is that this universe or consciousness creates our experience of physical reality through a language type of interface that everything interfaces that way. But whenever you go and say uh, it's literally ones and zeros in a computer code, you're mistaking language's actual function uh, for, you know, you're, it's basically like mistaking the finger pointing at the moon as the moon itself, or thinking that the deer that you see out in nature is actually naturally called deer. It is what it is, but we understand it through language and language is a system of relationships of symbol to meaning and, you know, sound to symbol and just a big network of, of relationships. And obviously the ecosystem of, of the cosmos is a big system of relationships. So it's only natural to, uh, to us that we understand it through the, the mental framework of language. But because that's the case doesn't mean that it's fake <laughs> or that it's actually, you know, when we say we're, it's a simulation, you could even understand that on a spiritual level that 
like it, no different than a dream as a simulated experience. Does that make the experience any less real or significant? No, not necessarily. Uh, so I really liked how you described that. And, and I think anyone that starts to deeply study language will come to similar realizations like, oh, that's what it means that the universe is like a computer code. Doesn't mean that it is a computer code. It's just that computers work because their code operates in a mathematical harmony that is similar to how universe has to work. But one thing I wanted to pick up on from the beginning of your, your thread there was talking about numbers. I wanted to know your thoughts on numbers themselves, having like a, a, a resonance or a spiritual essence or even a consciousness in and of themselves that even though, you know, the, what we call a number may be a construct, <laughs> but the essence of, of oneness, twoness, threeness, that there's some, something there that's intrinsic and it's own, like its own being or intelligence. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so it's a really great question. And yeah, just to go, uh, just one, what you said is that, yeah, the, the, the similar things to say, like people speak about Kundalini, uh, saying it, it's the serpent. That isn't what it is. <laughs> it's like a serpent. And it, when you read the original tantric system, there, there isn't a snake goddess. There isn't a snake deity. There was nothing about that. It's the understanding that the energy that moves looks like, feels like a serpentine energy. And so it's like we have to be able to describe what we're seeing, you know, and so we have to put it in, like you said, into a language of either number or shape or some sort of some sort of language to then share it. And so this is where we've kind of gone wrong because or, or not even wrong, but we've kind of limited our, our experience of it because we're saying that, you know, the universe is a, a computer code. It, you're missing the beauty. It, it's not that. We can only describe it as a computer code because that's, the, that's our level of consciousness. It itself is what it is, as you say, like the deer. And so like Kundalini, you know, it's, it's nothing to do with a snake. It's just that that was the, you know, in India, they're looking around and saying, and they're seeing a snake slither and going, that's what it feels like. It could really be a river, you know. Well, it, it also, the snake, just to tag on, is a great symbol for uh, logos or or the kundalini also because it has the quality of seeming to renew itself without dying. That it sheds its skin and then it's got a fresh coat of skin. So it's like it gives birth to itself. The same metaphor applies to the phoenix or the palm tree. Things that have this self-regeneration capacity are really important to the spiritual symbol archive because of that very reason and pointing us to that capacity that we have to generate internal energy in a sort of self-generated way or have that death and rebirth without physically dying and et cetera. So yeah, it's a very potent symbol and you got to get past the, <laughs> you just got to get past the, the literal ness of it and see how the the meaning applies metaphorically yeah and so yeah absolutely and that's what i mean that you know it's it's beautiful all, all of the the different interpretations and the deep and it goes so deep everything goes so deep uh, but what i'm saying is that the first sort of we've got to move past this idea that you know uh kundalini is serpent it's it it moves serpentine like and of course there's loads of benefits of understanding what serpentine energy is and the actual snake itself to dragons to you know as all the things that you were saying and so it's the same with number you know number really you can look at it as geometry because it's it's lines on a paper and so you know i i did art you know i trained in art so you know you've got a blank piece of paper and so if you draw a line any line it's going to be number one you know whether whether it's bent or curved it, it's still one line and so that's really interesting because that's the first law of polarity which is interesting because most people think of polarity as two-ness which it is but actually polarity is in the one because that one line either end of it it's one thing but the two ends are two different expressions of north and south so it's not about number two actually the law of polarity is about number one so that's interesting. So it's not two separate things coming together. It was always together. 
just experienced at two ends of the spectrum. So it's a spectrum, an octave of consciousness. And this it's is a hermetic way. thing that there's no opposites. There's just degrees of one thing. Like there's no such thing yeah. as cold. There's just heat and less heat. No such thing as dark. There's just light or less light. And when you get that, it also helps you kind of rectify the the lack mentality in yourself and realize you're never lacking anything. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, as you're speaking about light, for example, like it's interesting that we could say that the say like the light and then in the, in the dark, the dark is actually the most, you could say the most intense amount of light, but we just can't perceive that level of consciousness. And so right, this is when it's purely white light, you can't see anything. You're blind. You know, it's, it's no different than darkness. It obscures everything. And there's your octave again of the bottom is the top. The top is the bottom. You got to get up to get down that whole thing. Yeah. And that's why I say like, when we're talking about numbers and there's loads of numerology in this loads of understanding the numbers and that how they work with the gates and you know you can you it's so rich every single number and that's what i mean you look at number one and you can when you look at number one not just as a quantity but as a quality uh, and then that's when we start to find the nuances and then what happens when you bend that one on itself to touch the end you know you're creating that circular that oneness, you know, the, then you've got spelling of the spelling of the number of, of word of one is the, is the O, like an octave. And so hold on a minute. So one is a straight line, but one is also the curve. So you've got masculine and feminine, both saying the same thing. And so this is what I mean. We can really start to go into numbers like they really are consciousness. And so they are a geometry. Therefore, they are vibrate as a sound. They are colors, they are quantities, you know, they are different ways we can experience, as you say, that if we know that everything's connected and it's just a where we place ourselves on a spectrum, then okay, then then there's not a separation. We just know need to know which octave to get into to experience another light density or another dimension of that experience. Man, this is great stuff. <laughs> so I want to do more about the I Ching, but I actually kind of want to hone in on that word dimension because mm -hmm. I like to try to be precise with uh, what yeah. we mean by a thing and words often get all kinds of personal definitions attached to them. So like for me, uh, dimension usually means something referring to the spatial qualities of something. So length, width, height. And I understand it as uh, those three things kind of just solely those because of the fact that they connect to each other length connects to width connects to height and so i i don't necessarily conceive of time as a dimension for example because it's not connected spatially to those three coordinate system of what gives us material physical existence and in that sense we there are other types of dimensions like across those op, uh, polarity scales for example like hot to cold, you could consider a dimension if, if you understand dimensions as that which we can measure. But in terms of, um, you know, octaves potentially being that idea, a higher octave being kind of put out as a, a dimension of experience, mm -hmm. how do you understand that? Or like, how, would, how can we in, integrate that into our understanding of length, width, height, the physical reality that we are aware of? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And yeah, it, in the work, I've actually spoken about densities or light densities and dimensions. Um, but I would like to say, I think uh, because everything in my work is fourfold, it's quadrinity. So I actually have the what I call the quadrinity psychology that I created to, in this book to help people understand all of these concepts. So you would really you would say that the fourth axis in a way, which is the W axis, which is interesting because that's the symbol for omega. In the Greek, which is feminine, so the fourth axis being W, uh, I would say that is it's time and space together because you know we it's there is time and space and space and time and so really that they're kind of uh, you know they are that fourth axis even if it's not necessarily some a pole in itself, um, but yeah, essentially that um, dimensions I would say is that. We could look at it that there could be infinite dimensions within a certain d density or a certain thing. You know, it's like 
it's they're just the nuances of how to move into it. And so like we were saying about the number one, you know, seeing it as a geometry, that could be one density, seeing it as, you know, a quality could be another uh, dimension. And so I would say there's infinite dimensions possible within one particular sort of octave or one particular note. You know, you could have a thousand dimensions within the first note. And then the second note would be, say, like the next density, you know, because it's really light density is different to density of matter, as you probably know, you know, is that as we move up into light densities, it becomes more dense with light or consciousness and less dense of matter. So the lower densities are more matter and less light or less perceived consciousness. And then as we move up, we got higher consciousness and less density. And that's obviously reflected in our bodies and, you know, moving up in, you know, into our scales and into the atomic structure of carbon into silicon, which is crystal. Now that's the octave jump from carbon is silicon. So that's crystal where when you look at crystal, it's a highly constructed geometry shape that allows for light to travel through it. So really every, the, that is showing us that that is how densities works. But like I would say that dimensions, it's really, how much we can perceive within one thing you know when we both look at the same object we have you know thousands of dimensions we can speak about it and so that's where i think you know i think that the terms of say like 5d or 4d or even in mathematics when they speak about three dimensions it's three planes you know like you're saying the xyz axis that's mathematics in new age concept we'll speak about 5d really they're what they're referring to is the density, like light density, because dimensions you could have <laughs> infinite, really. It depends on however you want to explore it. So that's how I that's how I would share it. Cool, man. I I like the density levels lowering less consciousness idea because I think that that is observable in nature too. Have you ever seen the shores? and oceans under the ocean at the bottom of the ocean it's kind of hard to describe verbally but it's really wild so there are places on the ocean floor where there's a type of water or substance that is a density level below what the ocean is and there's wow. shores this denser water is pooled at the bottom and seems to go lower still and uh, submarines and underwater craft that try to penetrate it, they bounce off of the surface of it. No one's penetrated it that I know of. <laughs> and so like there's, oh, there's literally oceans. The ocean itself has oceans. And we look at how water in our oceans that we are aware of and that we can interact with has, uh, you know, that water is the same as our air, but just more dense. Because we are even in our atmosphere, we're in water right now. There's water in this air. It's just less density. And then we consider the the barrier between our atmosphere and what's above us. And it seems to be like an impassable barrier for us, at least biologically. And my point in bringing up that observation and maybe go look into the, the oceans at the ocean floor, because it is a trip, dude. <laughs> that, that seems to suggest exactly what you're talking about and that there are limitations in, in form that keep us within the boundaries of certain densities, but in consciousness, we know this from things like remote viewing or people who have had personal out of body experiences, those levels of, uh, those density levels are no longer as restrictive or the same type of barriers, but they may be, uh, there may be barriers to our comprehension because of the, things outside of the density level are so far beyond our scope of imagination. <laughs> Just like you and I looking at the same object would see different dimensions of information in that object based on what our imaginatory capacity or our knowledge background would clue us in to look for. Like two people looking at the same plant, one might know all the virtues of that plant and another one wouldn't be able to tell it from uh, an another plant next to it. Right. So that's, yeah. <laughs> really interesting concept but uh yeah check out the oceans below the ocean it's far out 
Yeah, I will do. And and I would just say that, yeah, when I said about sort of um, say, it's not so much less consciousness, it's it's more that there's a self of uh, self recognition or self awareness within those levels. So, you know, like a rock, it, you could say, or a crystal is, well, perhaps a crystal is slightly different, but a rock is sort of a sense of beingness. So it's it's not that it's a lesser consciousness, it's just more that it's it's just being. It's not trying to self-reflect. It's not trying to go on a hero's journey. You know, it's not trying to move up through levels necessarily. And so, whereas at our light density, you know, we have that cap capacity to self-reflect, and we obviously see this compared to animals. You know, some animals can self-reflect, and they almost seem like human-like, whereas other animals they don't seem to have that ability. And so. The more it's this more self awareness allows us to move up into those higher sort of more subtle realms of of understanding light as a consciousness, and that's how we obviously get this contact with you know angelic beings because it's that understanding of light messengers, you know, and so we interpret light messages as the angelic realm, and so that's where most people start to experience like oh I'm receiving a download from an angel. But what it is that you're really tapping into the archetypal plane of light. And so that's really where we can start to understand this now that it becomes more and more subtle where everything starts to communicate with you. And then that's when you're really becoming that ether. And that's why I say the initiation of ether is the, the great possibility for humanity at this time moving into Aquarius is that we have this chance for in, within our own consciousness to be non-local. You know, to be not just in the body and locally seeing what we're what's around us, but we have that ability to be able to perceive the whole entire cosmos and how that moves. You know, and we're kind of moving within that field, but we're also that field almost seeing down on our form, also. So there's this kind of sense that, you know, we are spiritual beings in the body, but we're also the, you know, the spiritual consciousness looking at the forms. And so that's really this pole shift, or you could say a, a higher octave, or even in a way going further back into the heart to like zoom out and see like, oh, I can actually now perceive much more than, you know, just my everyday to day understanding. And that's obviously where it's connected to the planets and the stars. Just like uh, cells in the body, in a sense, potentially are octaving up is like you're saying, becoming aware of the bigger body that we're a cell in all at once. You know, that that makes sense to me in the, the fractal perspective. I'm looking forward to returning for part two and going further into some of that I Ching stuff that we opened up, but got sidetracked on because there are just so many fun tangents. I'm having a great time though, Rob. Do you want to remind people ways that they can uh, find out more about your work or pre-order the book or any other things that you want to plug as we're switching from part one to part two yeah no just to go and visit the um www.thelostoctive.com because you know on there i've actually put uh, information out there already on there because you know to the people can start to learn and study and of course there you can pre-order the book uh which will be out early may and um you know you can follow my progress on all the social medias just under robert james comba on instagram and facebook um and yeah you can sort of be on this this grand journey with me. Really cool, man. Looking forward to talking more I Ching stuff in part two, and it's been really fun so far. Thanks for coming on. All right, everybody, welcome back. And we're here with Rob. Gonna get into the I Ching right away. So the first question I have about it is, mm, why, how How are you taking the system beyond 64 to 72? What inspired that? What's the logic of that? Because I understand the eight trigrams multiplied by each other gives you the 64, but what is the framework that allows you to go past that to 72 and you know, how that, how does that connect to astrology, the 72 processional cycle or other things that represent 72 in the realm? 
there's a lot there. So I'll just kind of let you <laughs> take it away from here. Yeah, no, uh, thanks for that. It's, it's, it's interesting. So basically, uh, as I said, I was creating my, I've created my own modalities, different modalities about the energy system, um, about uh, colorology and how that's connected to us. And so all of that was really, I had to understand these sort of universal keys through it. And so I started to learn more about astrology from that. And then I basically came across uh, this system called human design. And that system had placed the I Ching with astrology. So, you know, I was like, wow, that, you know, it looks really good. So I didn't study any of it. I just literally looked at the, 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 the grand, they have this sort of like grand map of sort of like the whole year wheel. And so when I was looking at it, this is really when Lionsgate happened. And that's really when the lost octave happened. So last year on the 8-8 Lionsgate, I was just, you know, <laughs> normal day as you do. And I was doing different works on, on my other modalities. And, um, and I just thought, let's just have a look at this map. I just had this real strong feeling that I just had this weight. It felt like a weight. And I had this strong feeling just to look at this map. So I just looked at this map and I just started to see like there was a gap. There was a hole. There was like, there was something, you know, because 64, although it's a cube, so it's eight times eight, uh, you know, 64 is the is a cube. Or eight times, yeah. So it does make sense in that regard, but really. That does that 64 doesn't really connect to any other numbers when you start to look at sort of other geometry other than just that part. So I kind of had this feeling that there was more in there somewhere. And so really I used my understanding of time mathematics or cloth uh, clock mathematics. And so I thought, well, that's strange because there's obviously 60 seconds, you know, in a minute, you know, so 60 minutes in an hour. So a really a 360 degree wheel is connected by the number 60. So trying to fit 64 hexagram, uh, 64 into a circle, it, it to me, it kind of like didn't compute that that's not really how the universe worked in, in time. And so simply what I did was I took put 60 from numbers one to 60 around the outside of the wheel. And this was the debt, the sort of the transmission I was receiving to do this at the t on the eight eight Lionsgate. So I literally was manually drawing this out one to sixty around the outside. Okay, I'm left with four hexagrams, right? So four from sixty one, sixty two, sixty three, and sixty four. So I just placed them like you would do in the center of the wheel in the four cardinal directions. So okay, that seems like a pretty logical way to go about it. Well, of course, there's twelve constellations. So when I when you draw 12 lines out from the center, of course, it pierces the north and south and the east and the west. But the other lines that go out, well, then there's eight positions. If the inside was to be a 12, so you've got 60 on the outside and 12 on the inside, four of those are covered. Well, then that leaves eight. And that's why I was like, whoa. That was it. That was the map. And of course, when I counted it, I'm like 72. Well, first of all, I knew that that was linked to the Hebrew sacred name of God, you know, from all of my esoteric work. So all of a sudden, I'm like, well, that's profound. Like, A, that I've found this quite simply, basically opening it through time. So now, in a way, I'm kind of taking a geometrical shape of a cube. And now linking it to time. So we've got space and time, matter and time. And so this is where I'm like, okay, this is really how it works. So that's really how I saw it as eight. And then I just had this connection to think about what was in the stars at the time. I don't know why I was just having this sort of moment of understanding this. And so I knew that Venus had just started her synodic cycle. Uh, her main cycle from in Leo. So she's the the lioness queen. That was that's the really the title of the Venus, what she's going through. And of course, the ancient uh, you know, Ishtar and Inanna symbol for Venus is the eight-pointed star. You want so, to know a cool Kabbalistic link to that, real quick. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the Hebrew word that's spelled uh, nun. Let's see. <laughs> I have to do math in my head. Hold on. It's nun, uh, nun vav gimel a. That equals 64. And it's an alternate name. It's like you would say like Noga or something like that. Alternate name for the Kabbalistic sphere that is more commonly called Netzach, which is the sphere of Venus. So there's the, the Kabbalistic sphere of Venus is a word that equals 64. I think that's pretty cool. It's interesting that I would say that she's the one that essentially opened that space up for me to see the lost octave. And so, of course, what's really interesting is that going into astrology on this is that the second, uh, oh, sorry, the seventh uh, sign is Libra, the, which is ve ruled by Venus. The second sign is Taurus, ruled by Venus. So well, I'm like, wow, this is just, you know, you know when it's divine because it, everything adds up. There's nowhere that it doesn't. And, um, and so, of course, I had this octave. I, I saw this Venus eight-pointed star. But when I saw that I'd done 12 in the center and then 60 on the outside, it was like, Oh, there's like a, a fractal, like there's the, got the core and then the outside. So when I drew the eight pointed star, I actually make, made it into a hypercube, which really all it means is that you add another star, the same star inside. So it's like a repeating fractal. So a star inside a star. So a Venus star inside a star. So when I did that, I'm like, that is that makes so much sense. That is the geometry of how I found it. And so now I was like, okay, so this automatically takes us into, in mathematical terms, the fourth dimension of space and time. And that's why I'm like, whoa, this is, uh, this is a jump. This is literally another octave of not just the dimensional 64 hexagrams in 3D, but now we're at this 12, which is really the master gates, takes us into the, the, next, the next octave of the fourth dimension in mathematical terms which would probably be more akin to say fifth sixth light density i really like how you describe it all just sort of weaving together and fitting together and yeah. my next question of curiosity would be in terms of if this is like a layer or an octave jump for that can be tacked onto the I Ching, what do the hexagrams look like is are we reusing the previous the first uh the first eight and they're just like a higher version or a, an evolved version of the first eight hmm. yeah great question and so obviously after like getting the geometry and the understanding of this it was like well what well what are they <laughs> it's like where what are the lines like what what are the hexagrams because you know how do i even work that and so really this is this is why I say it's a pole shift. So what happens is that if if you imagine that say 64 takes you sort of moving moving up layers, you have to kind of then re-go back through. So it's kind of like a Mobius strip, you know, like a, mm -hmm. a, a torus. It's like so once you reach the sort of the edge, the only way is back in, you mm -hmm. know, is back through the torus. And so this is where this pole shift happens. And so the only way that I could find it initially was that through the geometry, so the eight pointed star, when I put that over the, the gates, it pointed to certain gates. Oh, interesting. So then I went another way and I actually started to do mathematical calculations, basically reverse engineering. Like how would I do the I Ching in reverse? Right. So because I'm, I'm it's, it's, it's a pole shift. So it's like, OK. And then through that, the same results that I had in my mathematics align to the same geometry. And then I was like, well, that that's the gates. So this is what I mean, like everywhere I tried to disprove everything that I've ever found in this, the more it's concreted, like exponentially, like inevitably. That's why I've everything in the book is transparent, like how I've done it, like what it is. And I literally present it to the reader and say, well, this is all of the evidence. This is the journey I've been on. This is what I've discovered. 
you see, because every single number, not even by point one or point or one or two out, everything fits seamlessly. And then that's how I knew. So part of the secret is of this is that within the hexagrams, there's a very unknown understanding that the first hexagram in the I Ching originally that was actually written down did actually have a seventh line. I did not now, know that. Yeah. So that's one of the secrets that you don't really find out until you really start studying the I Ching and you look back at all these things. I've really had to do this. So the, the first hexagram for people out there is all uh, unbroken line. lines, all Yang lines. Mm -hmm. And it's just the pure outward projecting creative force. That's what it represents. Very powerful hexagram. Yeah. So it starts the entire I Ching and actually it's linked to Scorpio, which is interesting because you would think, oh, okay, that must be Aries. No, it's, it's so the whole start of the astrology of the I Ching actually starts in Scorpio, which is really interesting, which is like that death rebirth, right? Because it's like the it's the death of Scorpio, of the Pluto and the Mars, but it's it's also the rebirth. So it's kind yeah, of Scorpio has got more of an octave vibe than maybe any other of the signs, because yeah. first of all, there's that Aquila previous concept, that eagle, but then there's the scorpion. You know, I've always considered Scorpio as like representing the polarity between toxicity or purity in a way. Like it's the same water, but is it pure or is it, you know, holding toxicity and how that water can, the same water can do either. And, uh, are just like our, our, as human beings, we can get held up or, or harm or self harmed by the, misuse of the sexual creative energy that Scorpio represents. It's the, you know, genitals in our, in our body is where that's at on the Zodiac man, or that sexual creative energy can become something that is a huge driver for creating harmony in our life and creating lots more than just, you know, reproducing a human being, although that is the sort of utmost powerful expression of it. I did not know that the first hexagram was related to Scorpio. I really got to study up. I'm going to enjoy your book. I know when it comes out, but I really got to study up on the uh, astrological correspondences to the I Ching. Cause that sounds like a huge treasure trove of unlocking wisdom. Yeah. And that's what I say. You know, that's why, you know, for me, you know, when I knew, when I saw the human design, that uh, the guy who, who created it raw, um, you know, I don't know whether he did that or whether he found it somewhere and put it together. I don't, there isn't anybody that I, I've heard of that knows that part. So I put it to him. But for me, it was like, uh, it was like a blueprint, you know, so he he was like a sort of a bit like an engineer to me. Uh, you know, the way he put things together, it was very mechanical. Well, you know, when you're, when you're sort of an architect or an engineer, that's great because somebody's put a blueprint in front of you. And so that's why I could see it so clearly. So then I could decode that. So essentially that the what I found was that this idea of the seventh line was how it moves into that fourth dimensional plane. And so what I did was that I started to figure out which what the seventh line was for the uh the lost octave. And so then I had this sense of the lost octave being eight, but of course really in music a full octave is a chromatic octave which is 12 12 notes so an octave is the white notes the white keys and then a chromatic octave is then the the five notes that the black notes that are like half steps so i was like well that's interesting so a chromatic octave is you know that's 12 well that's like the 12 signs that i had in the center well what I couldn't believe was that the eight that I'd found that linked to the geometry, linked to the maths, when I added those eight in, the 12 that were in the center were each individual sign, no repeats. So, wow. Yeah, that's what blew. This is what I mean. For me, it was like, I mean, you can imagine this. I'm receiving this and I'm peeling this. And I'm like, so the geometry fits, the numbers work out. 
and when they slot in, no, there's not like two Scorpio gates or there's one master gate for every one of the zodiac signs. And that's why I was like, I knew, I knew this was just what it was. And it was really after that, when I started to go into meditation about this as a consciousness, I started to understand that this teaching was given as a master teaching verbally only from master to student. Because in the in the secret sort of tantras and, and all of these mysticism uh, lineages, you know, the final teaching that kind of like basically says you you've reached that point and here is the final gift from the from your the person you're studying under. It's always done verbally, you know, and so because if you knew this at the beginning, then why would you study anything else? Because you could just study these 12 master gates and know all 72 hexagrams. So that's really why I say it's the master keys, because if you just study these 12, you you can learn the others if you want to. But there isn't any necessarily any reason to, because you know the quintessence, you know, the the essence of of what the I Ching and what the story is trying to tell you. And so that's what I realized. It, it was uh, this verbal transmission that's been lost. And so this is what I was either remembering, receiving, however you want to be. But the fact that this all worked out on every single level and it gave us an extra line in the hexagrams. And so just to give you an idea on, on how, how that looks harmonically, which is really interesting. So 64 hexagrams times six lines because there's six lines per hexagram is 384 possibilities or archetypes well when you add 72 times six lines that pulls it into 432 <laughs> right which i don't think i have to explain to you what that number means so hold on a minute so by adding in those master gates that octave it's pulled the whole archetype, collective archetypes, into 432, the resonance of the earth, the, the, the number that is the pure music, the harmonic music scale. And, of course, that's all linked to the, the, the measurements of the pyramids of Giza. And it's, it's all that. So I'm like, wow. And, of course, then the understanding of where the seventh lines come in is that's where it starts to move into the the fourth dimension or the higher dimensions. And actually I've expanded on that even more. Uh, and that's what's allowed me to move into the quantum field. So basically, yeah, I, I always say that the book of changes, which is what the I Ching's called. So the book of changes is changing. So it itself is changing. It's evolving because we're evolving. And that's why I say this is the this is the what we're what we should have known up to now. And really, that's why it's here to sort of give us an understanding of music, astrology, geometry, numbers, harmonics, you know, how all that mathematics works and all of the ancient star law. It's like a complete like instant sort of update of what we should have known so that then we can move into that Aquarian age with this self-empowered knowledge. And understanding of things like binary code and the human genome. I mean, I had to literally study, you know, the whole human DNA genome. I studied music. I studied all of the astrology in all these different phases. So, like, I did all that. And so that's what's allowed me to bring it into bite-sized chunks and say, these are the keys. And these are the, this is the essence that you need to know in order to know then how that works holographically. I really like what you just said. The the book of changes is itself changing. That only makes sense. And when we observe nature, nature is in a constant state of change, which is the same as like the, the inscription at the Oracle of Delphi. People know about the know thyself part of the inscription, but very less frequently does somebody say the other part, which is certainty brings ruin. <laughs> <laughs> that we got to be always be open to the the next they also have nothing to excess is the third one that's maybe a little more self-evident but certainty brings ruin we should always be postured to receive the next uh evolution of our understanding or the next octave of it and it sounds like the way that this came about for you was very similar to how human design itself was brought into the world 
Uh, do you know what, like what your type is in human design? Yeah. So, uh, I'm a manifester like Ra. So I'm not <laughs> the same, uh, I'm not the same, um, lines as him because he's got a, he's got a throat line. So he just speaks and that's how, what he says, whether you like it or not, it's like, he just speaks it how he sees it. Whereas see, mine is the heart. So that's why it's different because my message is about trying to offer this so that people can comprehend it. It's not just, this is the way it is job done. It's like, no, th this has to be your, this has to work with your life. Otherwise it's just another fun thing to know, you know, it, it doesn't come part of your life. And so this is different. This is how do we make this, how do we make that hexagram anything to do with my life? How's that going to benefit me at all? And mm. so this is what the star, star law stories and everything I've gone into, that's how it's like, oh, well, if I, if I watch a movie and I can apply that to my life, you know, if I told a story and I'm like, oh, that's a great metaphor. I can use that. Like you were saying, like the book of changes is changing. It's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. So all these, it makes it so much more relatable and that's the way of the heart. But yeah. Um, I think another popular manifester is uh, Jordan Peterson. He's got the same um, throat gate as uh, Ra did. And so you can kind of see that he just sort of like speaks, you know, <laughs> what he's thinking. So, yeah, the manifester gate, I think it's um, it's something like, I don't know, it's 4% of the population or 8%. I don't know. Something like that. I think the rarest one is a projector, I think, or a reflector. I don't, I don't. I think I it's really the reflector that's the the super rare one. I mm -hmm. recently had a uh, a friend who does human design for people for clients on the podcast, so I learned more about it. It's mm -hmm. a bit less in my wheelhouse before that. I'm still learning, and this whole thing, your transmission, has got me very interested to comprehend it better, especially the astrology connections to I Ching. But I'm going to wait for your book to open that up and and see what comes out. But I yeah. found out in talking to uh, Sophie is her name in a recent episode. She was using my chart as an example, and I have definition in every center, except the two in the head are the ones that are open. And what is, what blew my mind about that was how, when I do my energy work, I use tuning forks and find stuck energy in people's aura. And uh, it, when I find the stuck energy, I also find information about what it is, how it got there and how old they were sometimes like dramatically specific, <laughs> but how, how it, how it works for me is after I had been practicing for a while, I noticed that when I would put my fork into a dissonant spot that I would get a signal in my head, it felt a lot like a cavitation type pressure differential uh, thing. And some the best way I can compare it is whenever you go up in elevation rapidly, your ears will pop and you feel like sort of a pressure in your head. It's like that, but without it, without discomfort or pain or, or hearing loss. But my head does that when I find what I'm looking for, that's sort of the, the, the physical cue or the way that it comes in. And to find out that that's in my human design chart, that those are the centers where I'm open and not defined. It makes perfect sense that that's where I would get my, my physical cues of, of detecting energy in the places where I'm more malleable or receptive to it. So that's really interesting. And I also <laughs> didn't realize that 384 was 64 times six, the I Ching resonance to that number, 384. My favorite tuning fork, I have this big, it's like <laughs> the huge tuning fork. It looks like Thor's hammer or something. And it's a 384. It resonates the G note. It's powerful to the throat. I mean, you can use it for anything, but that that throat g area is so uh profound in our mm -hmm. physiology because of anywhere that's probably the the biggest bottleneck for a lot of people <laughs> literally the bottleneck and uh anyway I, I'll, yes. I'll just kick it back to you i didn't ask a question but i'm sure some of the things i mentioned give you thoughts yeah and and of course you know a lot of my work the, the early part of my work was um you know when I connected to um, Robert Grant, Robert Edward Grant, um, about the lost octave, and um, and then it was just so happened that the second time uh, we actually had a a, a group meeting um, discussion, he was showing the King's Chamber, 
you know, and it through basically the, the knowledge of the lost octave, he'd found like he'd found glyphs on the walls, a petroglyphs, and he was drawing those. And so through this, I was able to then see the that they were constellations. And so really rapidly out of that, it was like, wow, we started to plan out the fact that this was an astrological star map. It was the precession of the equinox. And the reason why I'm saying that in relation to what you said about the, the note G is because, you know, with the Lost Octave, I've managed to find out so many amazing things uh, linking to music. Because obviously everything's all harmonically linked. And so every every gate, all 72 gates are all linked to music and they're all linked to and musical notes and frequencies so you can literally listen to the sound of your own birth chart you know you, you could you know play a musical song and you know you could literally know the notes of what what your gates are and so this precision of the equinox i basically figured out that that resonates the the what you call the short cycle which is twenty four thousand years uh, of the procession that actually resonates at the note g and of course the throat chakra is the great pyramids so the great pyramids are the throat chakra of the earth and it's all to do with the throat chakra so it's really interesting that the the procession of the equinox is the note g which is now you're saying is also linked to the throat chakra so and the pyramids are the throat chakra of the earth and this is what i mean it's like this global activation of understanding music harmonics how they're linked to us certain parts of our body uh, and how we can awaken that. And of course, 432 is the A note, which is, you know, really the the true harmonic that then everything else cascades off of that when you do A at 432. It's cool that you started to bring up the King's Chamber and your work with Grant about that, especially mm -hmm. because the next question that I had lined up for you was I was going to ask you if astrotheology demonstrates any of the discoveries you've made about this grand pattern reflected in the I Ching, or if we could just go more into astrotheology or more into that King's Chamber, kind of let you take it from there. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, with you, I, I'm not really familiar so much with the term astrotheology, but like, because to me, I call it star law. And, and star law is a term that is really the sort of ancient traditional way and law obviously being spelt as l-o-r-e rather than most people may think it's l-a-w it's not like a spiritual law like that it's law which basically means it's the conversation or the transmission of verbal transmission of the story of the stars and you know this is how this was done from you know, all of our ancient times and our elders, you know, it would all be the star stories, you know, looking out at the night sky with the campfires and going through this and people understanding this is like kind of like dream shamanic journeying, but you're kind of like, you know, very aware. So the star law is really how I explain the stories. And of course, that's really where we get every single Greek myth, every fairy tale, every nursery rhyme, like every movie it's all from the stars and so a lot of people think about well how do they get the divine inspiration you know it's like oh i had this inspiration for a movie well it's because the stars are really the grand gallery in the sky they are the free movie that you can watch and that's really what the elders did you know the aborigines would or the originals i should say you know they would they would sit around you know and looking at the stars and they would understand the story like the dream lines you know and so these memories are then passed from generation to generation and that's how they because they are us they are our archetypal story they are the collective consciousness and so that's why every everything that you can ever write about it's all related to the stars and of course this is where things like the bible um you know things like fairy tales and things like that that they've all taken all that knowledge from the stars and applied especially it the miracle stories yeah, it's just, yeah. And, and also things like the, the transfigurations or deaths and rebirths, because it's all the sun, you know, it's all the, like the eclipse. Uh, I even mentioned on um, a few days ago that I realized that the eclipse was the, 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 the stone of the tomb. So, you know, when the, the Christ is crucified and then goes into the tomb and then there's a stone placed over the tomb for three days. And obviously three days is 72 hours. That's really interesting. 
the summer solstice and the winter solstice is 72 hours, number 72 again. So when the stone is rolled away and then the light comes, the resurrection, well, that's an eclipse. And the stone is the moon that rolls. It's not the stone of the tomb. It doesn't just get shoved or, or just pushed over. It rolls away. Well, it would have to be circular. Well, then that's the moon, the stone. And so this is where you can literally see the transparency of all stories, all concepts. And what I like to say is it doesn't matter about, it's not trying about disproving anybody's beliefs or religions, or it's just saying that actually it makes it so much more beautiful that these stories that have been, like say, biblical stories, they're, they're there today in the sky and they happen every year. You know, Little Red Riding Hood happens every year. The Three Bears, the Goldilocks and the Three Bears happens every year. And so if we knew that as children, then we would be more connected to the universe more connected to the stars and, and to the, the cosmic field rather than just going, oh, that was a great story, you know, and then kind of just see it as an archetypal or meta metaphor. It's, it is happening all around us every day. Uh, and so that's really what, what I'm trying to bring and show that this is, this is alive. This is here. There's so many things about it too, that are beyond our understanding, like in terms of how the monomyth found its way on mapped onto the stars in this star lore. When I say astrotheology, we're talking about the same thing. I'm just referring yeah. to how all the religious systems are derived from, or they're up there, <laughs> but it's still, what's interesting. You say the book of changes is changing. It's still changing today. The mm -hmm. consider, I think it was like, I can't remember, but Chiron, the, the mm -hmm. comet, I guess it's now decided on that it's a comet was, I think, discovered in like the 70s. And mm -hmm. by that time, astrology was very well established for many thousands of years. Right. Uh, but some astronomer, not an astrologer, uh, supposedly yeah. discovered this comet and decided, ah, I'm going to call it Chiron. <laughs> I just like that name. And uh, that ha all of a sudden invested that comet with all the meaning that Chiron represents in the mythology, the wounded healer. <laughs> you could go on and on about that. Yet, even though seemingly it was just a random decision by a non-spiritual person, and we're all spiritual, but right, like just this is the narrative that got Chiron its name. We modern astrologers look at that as one of the most important things in the chart, aside from the planets, to describe where somebody's core wound is or what they're sensitive to. And it gets weirder than that. Like the recent eclipse you brought up <laughs> at the, at the same time that the eclipse was happening and Chiron was like conjunct with all that. There's also the return of a, the Ponds Brooks comet, which is a, uh, I think is on like a 71, 72 year return cycle, oddly enough. And we can look at eclipses as sort of bookended by lunar eclipse, solar eclipse that like the what sandwich between those two things is important and back on. So the solar eclipse was May 8th or uh, April 8th, but before that March 25th was the lunar eclipse and the very, that very night, I mean, technically it was 326 that this happened, but in terms of the daylight cycle, it's still the darkness of the night of 325, the, <laughs> the date of the lunar eclipse. We have the Pons Brooks comet happening in the sky and there's the key bridge that gets hit by a boat and collapses. Well, <laughs> Chiron is depicted as a key and ponds, me, ponds, brooks means bridge over water, right? So like this is all happening in the sky, but it's literally happening in the collective consciousness of, of media events. And Chiron only got its name and Pons Brooks only got its name seemingly through random accident, yet it all orchestra it all plays out as if orchestrated by some divine plan. This is mm -hmm. the level of weirdness that you get to open up to when you start <laughs> looking at things mystically. And there's just there's no turning back from there that you realize, okay, we're in some kind of giant mind and we're all tapping into the same giant mind. And even things like nothing is random and every decision counts and affects the whole fractal. Is, uh, so thoughts on all that. I just wanted to lay all that out because it's so wild. 
Yes, no, it's, it's it's so good because really the so the book title is obviously it's the Lost Doctor, but the the sub part is our story in the stars. So that's that's really alluding to the fact that the stars is us, we are them, and so we're playing out that story that's up there on here. It's a mirror. It's a complete mirror of what it is, and it, we're it's not that it's separate things it's the same thing we're made of <laughs> the same stuff and so you know this is where once you understand the stars and you understand the star law then you understand your journey because you have been it's like you come down onto the earth so to speak with this map which is your birth chart you know this sort of this time and space and even if in a way because that is the belief system you've come into so you could say that the, all the calendars are wrong but every calendar is wrong. No, nobody actually knows what date and what time it is, because if you have a 13 month or a 12 month or a leap year and people have chopped and changed history, we have no idea whether that birth time and that birth chart is even is anything at all. But it doesn't it doesn't matter because that's the the blueprint that you start with. It's like it's the thing that you can go, OK, this is me. This is what I kind of came here with. And then that's why you have to take the journey to find out the truth of who you are, find out the truth of all of this. And these are kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a computer game. You know, you've got different gifts that you can unlock, you know, along the way and everybody's different. And so that's why I say that the Lost Octave is 12 Master Gates because you, you should learn the whole pie. You should learn the whole thing. And, you know, this is why it can take quite a lot to learn all 72 hexagrams individually. You know, that's quite a, a lot to go into. So by having the master gates, it's like, okay, I can learn 12. You know, they're the 12 zodiac signs. So I'll learn 12. And then, you know, all 72 just from that. So this is where you get to understand that you are all signs. So if you're only looking at, oh, I'm born in this month and I'm this, then that is such a narrow view of what you have access to. And so this is how we've missed this understanding of how we can relate to each other. You know, so because I know, say, a Scorpio's journey, what they, what they, what they are destined to go through in their life, then when I see them in a pattern of like going through a death process and going into a next evolution, that changes my view of that person in their life to go, wow, pff, congratulations, you're leveling up. Not like, why are you completely melting? What's wrong with you? It's like, Again, wow, the you... bottom is the top, you know? People mm -hmm. find their inner light when they go through the, the lowest point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this understanding, because this book is about, I call it the, uh, on the quantum language, it's the error correction codes of astrology or the error correction codes for the collective consciousness. because. This is obviously all about Venus. Venus is about two-ness coming together as oneness or the recognition that that, that two-ness is already oneness. And so she's trying to pull everyone together collectively. And so when we understand someone else as well as understand ourselves, and this is where we get re you know, deeper relationships, deeper understandings of compassion, of empathy, of actually not just treading over someone to get to another place, we actually pick each other up and move together. And so this is, that is Aquarian. That is what it's all about. And so that's why I say, if you, you learn the whole thing as one, because you are all of them and you probably have multiple of these signs in your natal chart anyway. So you probably have pretty much all of them. If you, you actually technically all have all of them, it's just a matter of what planets might be in one or another, but empty, yeah. An empty uh, region of your chart is still a sign connected to a house and it's still going to inform something about who you are and all of that. So, yeah, we, we're, we're the whole deck of cards. That's for sure. Yeah. And so this is where, um, you know, it starts. Uh, so the 60, 61, 62, 63 and 64 were already part of the uh, 64 hexagrams which is really interesting because it's almost like it, it's done four into that 60 octave. So if you think about you kind of got the tens, the twenties, the thirties, the four, you know, and they've all got master numbers. Well, what's really interesting was, and this will blow your mind is that, so I was in Leo, right? So the eight, eight, the download, the geometry is fitting. 
everything's all mathematically eight times eight out. 64 you know you're yeah. you're at the 64 let's go past it <laughs> i'm i'm kind of blown away so i'm like okay what's 65 you'll never guess 65 was leo so i'm in Lionsgate on the 88 and all of this math is working out and the first, and the next gate that is 65 which is a which is a dna coupling the the hexagram and the pentagram is a is how the dna is connected together on a cellular level so the penta the pentahexa or the hexapenta so that's really interesting that it's a, an 11 so it's a master number and so all of a sudden i'm in leo and the first gate of the higher octave is 65 and then that's where it was like wow this really is like everywhere i go it's just more and more and more and so then of course it works in patterns so you have the you always have an opposite gate to yours so this is where another thing that people haven't known is that say if you're a leo if your sun sign is leo then what I call that would be that say your birthday, and what I've done in the book is I actually I actually call it your Earth Day, which is the opposite sign of your Sun, and so of course that's Aquarius. So all of a sudden I had Leo was sixty five, but across from that was the age of Aquarius sixty six, a master number. Whoa, that's huge. So the the Aquarian gate is the is the highest master number. In the 72 hexagrams as gate 66 so these were the first two and then of course it then goes into the next calculation was 67 which worked out as sagittarius and then of course 68 then its super partner becomes gemini you see so they work in twins and that's how you that's how i started to figure it all out and so then that's what happened that the the last two gates so you have um let me do 69 so 69 is aries opposite aries is libra gate 70 which is interesting because then the the 70 the first seven is balance and the way in which i describe libra is it's not and about libra's the seventh sign yeah exactly <laughs> I, I understand that is venus right so, so and the way i describe libra in the book is that it's not just about the balance of libra Libra is about the octaves. It's the scale of octaves, not just a scale of balance. It's the scale of music. It's that amazing way to think about Libra. I always think, oh, you know, how to be in balance and Libra is about balancing. And that's what the, nar the narrative has been about Libra. Well, the lost octave showed me it's not necessarily just that's one part, but it's about moving up and down the spectrum of dimensions and densities. It's got that ability to move in and out of higher and lower understandings. And how with the scales as a metaphor, if you raise up to a higher level of understanding, you also comprehend a lower depth on the other side, right? Yes. Like just as if the well, dark night of the soul leads you to new heights and like you, like you have to have one with the other. So the scales is such a good metaphor, even for raising an octave, because at the same time, you're going to see the higher up you are, the further down you're going to see uh, all that. It's, yeah, and it's like a tree, right? The, the, the deeper the roots of the tree, the taller the tree gets to the, the stars and the sun. So it's this simultaneously moving out and then coming together again. Like I was saying, that law of octave, it loops on itself. And so then 70 is Libra, which is hilarious you know and then we have 71 which is scorpio well gate one is scorpio and then gate 71 is scorpio well that's interesting that we've got the same it worked out the same number one but just with the seven as in seven octaves up well that's super interesting and it gets even more crazy because opposite gate 71 is gate 72 which is in taurus it's super partner and the hexagram in Taurus is number two. So there was this interesting mirroring that in the traditional 64 hexagrams, 60, uh, number one and number two is Scorpio and Taurus. In the lost octave, it ends up being that 71 and 72 mirrors the Scorpio Taurus. Mm. That's and pe people listening 
right now, I maybe should have said this earlier, but if you go to the lost octave, there's a page of these gates from 61 to 72. And that might help you conceptualize what Rob's talking about, but essentially these next octaves are not as hard to understand as you might think, or like you, you, Rob, didn't have to sort of make up an interpretation for them. You're literally saying that, for example, 71, which is uh, gate 71, you're saying Scorpio, that it's the higher octave of, number of hexagram number one, the creative. So it's the same, <laughs> you know, it's the same idea, but just like a, an expanded or bigger picture version of it, which is yeah. itself a little hard to conceptualize with something as primal as the creative. But I do understand the logic to this. And it's uh, it's really interesting, man. If you, if you think about it, that say the heck, there's six lines in the hexagram. And of course, this goes into the 70s. So therefore, there's a seventh line. So really, there's seven yang lines. If you think about it so in in the first 64 there's six lines because it's 60 and six lines so they're, they're matching you see like fractals but of course when it goes into 70 then there's a seventh yang line so it's still all yang but it's now got a seventh yang line so this is what i mean it's 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 all just another that's why it is another octave it's just uh the same kind of patterns but it's just a slightly different variation and what I'd like to say about this is that this is the transition from binary code into trinary code, which is the link of moving us from two strand DNA into three strand DNA. Which is the what the I Ching kind of was to begin with going from just pure yin yang to, uh, you know, a three line system of uh, the trigrams coming together. That is interesting. Yeah. So that's why I say it's lost. It's, it's not necessarily that this is, although it is new and it kind of is for our time in a way, it, it was there all along. We just didn't, we just couldn't perceive it. And then that's why I say it, that's why it's a loss because something that's lost is not really lost. It's just forgotten for a while until we re-remember re it. And so now with the understanding of quantum, you know, the quant making this into the quantum field and hyperdimensional geometries, if I didn't understand, if I didn't have that knowledge, then I wouldn't be able to perceive the map. So we needed to move out into the next dimension, the next octave, to then see how this can go. Because in a binary system, this seems quite close. You know, it's like, oh, that's what it is, and that's it. But now if you introduce a trinary system, which computer code already has that ability, uh, we they just don't use it because it needs more processing power, which is a great analogy to understanding. So the only reason why we still have binary code in our computers, which is takes up loads of data and is very cumbersome in a way, is because you actually need a higher processor to deal with trinary code. And it makes the memory less. So you only need a small amount of memory, but you need a bigger processor. Well, that's the same as us then. We only need to remember a small amount of data, but we need to be able to process that data faster, bigger bandwidth of consciousness. And of course, then you get into the quaternary system and then you go more and more and more. And that's how it just multiplies in octaves, in fractals. So harmonically, I've already um, lined out the harmonics for the male and female aspect of the DNA. And then also the, the chi, the child. So you've got the alpha omega frequencies and then you've got the chi. And the thing is, it's amazing about this is that when you look at them, they're the Tesla numbers. Hmm. Three, six, nine. Yeah. So, but, but to, to calculate that and to see that in the code and then to reveal that that's, that they're three, six and nine. I mean, this, this is why I say for me, everywhere I went, I was just blown away because it's almost too perfectly perfect. There's nothing in there that is like, Oh, that's just your own opinion. This is just uh, maybe you've created this and made it. It's like there's mathematics there and all of the geometries, everything is there, the harmonics. And that's why I say, you know, that the whole part of the book is what I call the way of transparency. And that's like the way in which you go through the book. Because, it, you know, like the ancient Taoists, they have things like the way, you know, like the, the way of the Tao. And so this came through of like, well, how do you work through this book? How do you work through this comprehension and integrate this? And so it's the way of transparency. 
And of course, that's in itself an open invitation linking to the understanding of the initiation of ether. Because it's like, well, if if you could imagine yourself as just transparent, that the, the, in a way there is no you, it, you're just consciousness in a way. Well, all of a sudden you've taken away any sense of me or I-ness, you've taken away a sense of blocked or I've got blocked chakras or I've, my body's there or I've got beliefs. You're transparent, there's, no, there's nothing of you. There's just an awareness. And so then you can penetrate everything. You can receive everything. You're, you're nothing, but yet you're everything. And this is where it starts to open you up into this multidimensionality. And then you start to see it all as one great big fractal picture. I, I like that. It's sort of how you have to get into the not knowing state if you're ever going to know a thing. You know, and yeah. that's <laughs> that's just how life works. Uh, and another thing that uh, sparked my curiosity is what you think about Selfeggio numbers, because you just brought up the three, six, nine. I've personally riddled out a lot of amazing numerical relationships that demonstrate potentially what the Selfeggio numbers mean. I've used the Selfeggio frequencies quite extensively in my work with uh, tuning human beings. And I, I don't, you know, I, I never have found any validity to some of the you know, YouTube <laughs> meditation frequency number, like <laughs> repair DNA or you know, whatever it is. It says that each of those numbers will do. And I, I get it. The <laughs> intention is, is helpful. And if you attach an intention to a frequency, it can carry that intention. So I'm not, I'm not knocking all that, but I have found that there are, that there's something about those sets of three with the self uh, you know, the way that it's organized that does have, you know, there's a there there that I've discovered, but I'll save that. And I'll just ask you like, what, yeah. what do you think uh, about self numbers or did that, does that play into the lost octave? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, as I say, there's so much I could put in the book and, you know, and these things will be, I'll probably go into more detail as well, but yeah, of course it's in there. Um, because really like we were saying about language. So Frejo is just a, it's a, it's a language to try and describe relationships between certain frequencies and certain, you know, codes. And so, you know, that's obviously, it, it comes back to, uh, you know, how we do the musical tones of the do, re, mi, so far ti do, you know? That stems back from the ancient hymn of St. John the Baptist. So it's not like it was like, oh, that's a system. You know, these things are sort of extracted from a, you know, an ancient hymn and then put in and then frequencies that were added to this to mean that, you know, do means this frequency. That's purely just put together. It's a bit like the chakra system. There was no colors of the chakra system. The ancient tantras didn't assign orange to your sacral chakra that that's completely a new sort of almost a Jungian type psychology to try and get us to understand oh the rainbow is seven colors there are seven chakras so that that makes sense and then kind of you know, like how chiron was called chiron but then it came to mean it came to yeah. really actually embody the meaning or always did somehow yeah uh of the so wounded healer yeah, absolutely. And so, when, I mean, you know this because if you look at sort of the ancient Tibetans, the root chakra is yellow. It's gold. So, you know, and, and so it's like the third eye is orange. It's like, what? You know, so because all it is, is we put stuff to things and it's all, that's what I mean, everything's a story, really. It just depends on how you want to look at it. So the self radio thing is, it's a, you know, it's a great way to understand it, but if you really look at the understanding, it's basically a, a calculator. If you look at a normal calculator, you'll see 369, 258, 147. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's maths. So all it is, is it's that three by three, which is a like a, a you know, essentially a, a magic square or a cube, you could say. So that square and how the ma how a calculator is that's that's self radio that's the relationships, but what's really interesting is if you were to do it like what I've done with the lost octave is, the the first line actually connects to the fourth line, right? So in in the hexagrams, so if you have six lines, so the first line does actually connect to the fourth line harmonically, 
and then the second line does connect to the fifth line harmonically and the third to the sixth so that then does follow the same pattern as the calculator and the self radios so it's not necessarily kind of like a, how i will throw in too how with the one four and seven mm -hmm. they have this resonance to each other in the way of theosophical addition and reduction so like if you break out the the integers one plus two plus three plus four that equals 10. Mm -hmm. and if you do the same thing with one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven it's 28 which is a redu reduces back to one so if there are there's a all of this divine intelligence to that to breaking the the nine integers into that sort of three by three grid where they loop back to themselves if you know how to play with them yeah absolutely and so this is all you know so many people you know like pythagoras and plato and you know all of this all this numerology and understanding of consciousness of numbers and maths it's all there you know magic squares are you know esoteric wisdoms you know they're all linked to planets you know so i think a three by three is saturn i think uh a three by three magic square is saturn I think so. yeah and then there's you know jupiter and a mars and the moon and so it's like these correlations have already been done and so this is why it's a universal kind of known that these sets of patterns connect and so that's obviously reflected in tesla's numbers you know as these harmonics so what i would say is that if you know the frequency the frequency is the most important thing it doesn't matter necessarily what color what chakra what musical tone it's perceived to be linked to in a way that's kind of just because it, there was seven of this and seven of that so then no that makes sense we'll put them together and it kind of does make sense you know it's not like it's like completely distorted it, it does kind of make sense why you would have the root chakra as red you know uh, it does make sense and why you would have like a sort of a sense of higher consciousness in the third eye and crown and they would be the sort of a higher up the visual color spectrum it's not like it doesn't make sense but to say that something is something exact like that's because it is that's not it at all because as i say the original tantras they were just chakras they, they weren't colors they were just the essence what, what does it feel like and like you were saying when you play the the tuning forks it's the feeling and the connection to the the frequency get rid of the label it's what the frequency is saying that's the most important that's the essence of it and that's why i say when you go through the I Ching, you, you've got all the numerology you've got all the elements it's linked to even all the astrology when you really sit with that gate at that time of year you know what does it feel like you know and that's how you 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 go past just learning and you go into direct experience of receiving it for yourself because it doesn't matter what somebody else tells you it, that's what it means if that's not if that doesn't if you don't connect to that in that way often people think that they're wrong and then they're like oh I, my i'm not very good at connecting in to myself or i'm not spiritually at that level because they seem to know all these labels absolute rubbish it's, you know, we need to just go back to you know what does this frequency feel like to you if you could put a color to it, if you could put a thing, and of course, everybody's going to probably have, you know, m multiple different versions, but there may be a cohesive collective consciousness that will arrive. And if we started to go back into all of our systems and do that and see like, what is actually, if we put a hundred people in a room and played this one frequency, I wonder what the three things they would say about it and then see if that would correlate because that's direct experience. And that's what I'm inviting people into this because it's i'm giving you all of the tools and patterns that i've found and said figure it out find for yourself go and experience see if what i've said is true for you it's not that it's it that is what it is it's just i'm guiding that that's what i've perceived that's what it's the myths are about and that's what the typical planets and the hexagrams are about but you know my view is to bring it into that aquarian you know understanding to empower people to go into every gate themselves and and that's where they explore the journey man really well said i feel like that's just a perfect cap to an awesome conversation and i want to also add on to what you're saying about how the correspondences of this to that in occultism or mysticism 
are kind of an endless source of confusion and division <laughs> between systems. And it's a probably a, a healthier way to look at all that as languages. And some people even speaking the same language have radically different accents, right? <laughs> so when we think of it that way, it's like, okay, we're trying, we're using these systems of correspondences are our method of indicating what our intention is. So we line up this color to this shape, to this time of day, to this date, to this body part, to this crystal, et cetera, et cetera. But all of that is just a way to shore up our, our knowing that our intention is coherent and our actions are in alignment with that intention. And so in that sense, a lot of these correspondences could potentially change for you as the one practicing whatever it is you're practicing based on how it literally feels for you and to not, not get too hung up on trying to get all the correspondences just right and instead feel your way through it. And maybe your version of it is a little different, just like you say lore the way I say law, <laughs> but we're saying, you know, but we're saying the same word is just an accent thing. Um, and that will probably alleviate a lot of confusion and a lot of division. And I really like how that you laid all that out. I just wanted to add that to it. If you've got any, you know, closing thoughts at the, as a, no rush about that, but uh, it's been an awesome conversation. Yeah, no, it's really been great how it's shaped. And, you know, one thing I love to sort of see as an analogy is this, right? Like that we all have to learn how to sort of to drive. Say you're interested in driving. You have to learn how to drive, which is, you know, do everything like check your mirrors and you have your hands like kind of like in this 10 to 2 position and everything's by the book, right? To pass the test. And you have to do that in order to get a license. But a racing driver, would does nothing whatsoever linked to being able to drive a car a traditional way. So you have to sort of learn kind of through these processes of correspondence and, you know, this crystal means this because it, you've got to have a bearing of some sort of foundation. But once you increase your understanding of patterns and you become self-empowered through that, then that's when in a way you can break the rule, you know, you can throw the, the, the manual it back, you know, into the fire because you've absorbed it. it you are that transmission now and so you you don't need to refer back to what that was it's like well although this is meant to be for the crown actually i feel like for you this is more like your heart stone like and so then it's 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 more about the presence it's not just like a label that we're we're connecting with people on on a facade we're connecting on a deeper level where we're feeling each other's oryx expression and like we were saying about dimensions you know the same flower we're seeing it in two completely different biases different conditioning different uh, experiences we've had you know things we've learned and you know but when you when you can just tune into the pure essence of it then then that's really where it becomes universal we both tend to agree on that purity that we find within everything and that's why we love set up the I Ching, because we know the central core message within the I Ching, forgetting everything about all of its, you know, parts, it's alluding to this wholeness that we are all these fractals. And that's the thing that we that everybody can agree on. You could say that it, that enjoys the I Ching. It's like, yeah, this there's a truth that's you can't even say what it is, you know, it's the Tao that can't be expressed, you know, because it's just I just love all of this. I love learning, I love going into this. And I think if we can just continue to empower people with this sort of knowledge and know that once we get to a certain point, we have to, in fact, actually let go of everything we've known in order to move forward into that next octave, that next uh, experience. Got to get up to get down. Got to get down to get up. <laughs> got to forget to remember and uh, got to unlearn to learn. All of that is true. It's a, a really fun reality we're oscillating through and it's been a Excellent conversation, Rob, and maybe we can do it again. I'm going to definitely pre-order the book and look out for anything that we might have missed that we can get further into in a future conversation if you're down. Yeah, no, for sure. I think I think it's really great to, uh, you know, move into also some of the star lore about this and also the, the quadrinity psychology because that's a revelation in itself because um, that speaks of how we are going to start to perceive psychology in the next uh octave of understanding um mm. we've kind of been used to that union psychology um but this takes it to another 
another octave in there as well. And so those things would be really great to share. And um, as I say, there's so much in here. And, and that's why I say the book is like, a, it's really is like an encyclopedia, a, com a compendium of all of the traditions, the mysticisms, you know, all of that stuff. It's all put in there, but it's all so easy to see. It's all laid out, you know, and that's how it was it's been put in the book so that it's not so confusing. It's not a whole load of things. It's very easy to assimilate. It may take a while to fully grasp it because there, there's some pretty interesting uh, stories in there and interesting metaphors and how to apply it. But really, it's quite a simple, a simple way to really upgrade to where you're, you know, to where we, we should have been really as a collective consciousness. Brilliant, man. I think we're getting there. Conversations like this give me a lot of hope that uh, the fact that there's an audience for it gives me a lot of hope that we're on, well on our way to the next octave. So thanks for coming on, man, and you be well. Yeah, thank you so much for this and great to have this conversation with you. It's been really great to dive into some of these, you know, deeper parts. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on the conversation. Cheers. Ah, are we having fun yet? Man, that was a really cool conversation. I don't as often go into a podcast without a lot of preparation. And when I first contacted Rob, I wanted to know, can I get a advanced copy of the book or something like that, that I can use to shape the, the talk. But Rob was confident that we would be able to hold a, a good podcast thread without me having previewed the book, which turns out he was completely right about. And now it leaves me with the opportunity to enjoy that book when it does come out and pick and choose some topics out of it to potentially bring it back with. So I appreciate the energy that Rob brought. He's definitely got a lot of clarity in his mind right now. You can feel it. It's in the way he communicates. I love that energy. And I'm very impressed that this entire book was brought through in about a course of eight months. It's not... That's not an easy achievement, especially 400 plus pages. So uh, if his writing is as coherent as his conversing, then it's going to be a really good adventure. So I hope you guys are digging this topic as much as I am. I really like the, uh, I really like the I Ching and I really like the ways of syncretizing one system to another. I'm just at the beginning of the journey of understanding how the I Ching might relate to astrology. And it's a fascinating language to think that there is such a correlation when the I Ching is a supposedly Eastern system that we're trying to map to a Western astrology system, but eh, maybe it's not that Western. I guess the, uh, the, the Indian folks have a pretty much similar Zodiac. Regardless, if you guys like this and you want to hear part two, which I do recommend because we definitely get into some more of the nitty gritty in part two, all you got to do is jump on patreon.com slash interverse or you can join rockfin r-o-k-f-i-n slash interverse uh, dot com slash interverse you get it or the youtube membership option that is all three of those are going to be linked in the show notes simply takes a little bit of support to me and my channel and you get the second hour of this conversation and all the other second hours so what did we talk about in part two? First of all how the human design system served as some inspiration for rob's realization of the expanded I Ching. And we talked about some astrological correspondence to the I Ching hexagrams. Maybe the most interesting part was this huge thread about how the book of changes, which is what the I Ching is called, is itself changing. Who knew? <laughs> I love that because it's been sort of a rigid dogmatic system for so long, yet what we know about octaves and music does give us the possibility that that could be a thing. Super interesting. The, uh, we also talked a lot about the human story in star lore. That's what Rob calls it. I call it astrotheology. We're talking about the same thing. And then we actually did go through the higher octave of the I Ching all the way up to the 72 and what each of those actually is and how Rob came to the conclusion of what each number was, which that was to me going to be the hardest thing to sell, <laughs> but it makes sense. It makes sense in a musical way. There's harmony to it. Uh, and not that I'm going in just all highly skeptical or scrutinizing, but I needed it to make sense. And it did make sense. 
And I appreciate that. And you can find more if you do get into the plus extension, you can find uh, more context by going to Rob's website, thelostoctave.com and checking out the, the tab on gates and looking at that while you're going through part two, that will help it make sense. Then we talked about self edgeo frequencies. We talked about the language of esoteric correspondences and how to feel your way through that. Uh, he mentioned a little bit about the procession of the equinoxes showing up represented in the King's chamber and the Giza pyramid and so much other stuff. Uh, the plus extension is a bit longer than the free portion this time around. All the more reason to jump into it. And I'm grateful that I get to do this as my job. <laughs> I don't necessarily have a lot to leave you guys with in the outro. I feel like there's plenty more on the table, though, for Rob that we could discuss. I particularly liked that even though some words got thrown around like quantum and dimension and ether and all that, we really didn't get too far out into the new age uh, weeds. <laughs> and maybe in a future conversation, we can further define and distinguish what we what we each mean by phrases like quantum. I've gotten a bad taste in my mouth over it from lots of, I call it waffle, waffly word salad that says something but doesn't actually say anything, right? Uh, but I don't, I didn't get that from Rob. I could follow the threads he was pulling on on everything that he talked about. And like I said, very coherent and clear, super fun. Other things we could talk about with him in the future might be colorology, what he means by that, uh, and his quadrinity psychology that's in the book. So if you liked his vibe and you want to support the man and and learn about the system that he's, I don't know, channeled might be a good word for it, or inferred, then go to The Lost Octave and pick up the book. I plan on checking it out, actually. There's not a lot out there that I've ever been attracted to to understand the I Ching better. And maybe this is the thing that unlocks new levels of understanding for me. I think it's kind of an intimidating system for some people. To me, it was intuitive, but what I learned through was the Osho Tao Oracle. So if you look up Tao Oracle, it's basically the I Ching condensed into Oracle cards. And that helped a lot. And the book that comes with that had some really clear understanding for, for me anyway, it worked for me. <laughs> what actually got me into divination? It's a funny story. I, I was very normie at the time, but I was at this camping, overnight camping music festival and I had stayed up all night and I was walking the property around sunrise with a friend. And as we were walking, we saw somebody that we had, you know, this very heady dude that we had met, uh, at around the campfire the night before I saw him from a distance and he was sun gazing. I didn't know much about sun gazing. I knew that's what he was doing because he said he was going to do that. But as I watched this guy sun gazing, <laughs> he turned, I swear, his skin turned blue, like to my, to my perception, turned like this purplish blue color. And I kept watching. And as he broke contact with looking at the sun, then his skin went from blue back to like an orangey color and then eventually back to normal. But while I was watching this, the, the friend I was with was looking at the guy too. And we both turned to each other at the same time. We're like, did that guy just turn blue? And <laughs> we both saw it. I don't know what that means. But the point was afterwards, we made our way back to the circle campfire area. And some people had rounded up lawn chairs to do a divination session. And I had never been part of like Oracle cards or tarot or I Ching or anything like that. I had no idea what it was about, but I did know that the guy that I saw turn blue was part of the circle and he got handed a card out of the deck or he drew a card out of the deck. I think it was called like transformation or something. And it had a picture of a blue skinned humanoid. <laughs> and I swear, I looked through the deck. There was only one card with blue people on it and it was the one he got. And I was like, what the hell? I just saw him turn blue. And I had had a psilocybin experience the night before. So maybe that's why I was primed to see someone turn blue. Who knows? But I wasn't on it anymore when the, when the visual happened. But I, in my psilocybin trip the night before, had had like a particular word on my mind. I was like, integration, integration. My whole intention for the trip was about integration of, of shadow. And I really, like compared to now, had very, very scanty understanding of what that would even mean or entail. But thus, you know, the point is 
integration was my buzzword. And that was the, that was the card that I drew out of this deck. I got a card about integration and I was like, okay, synchronicity, major synchronicity here, <laughs> multiple synchronicities, probably more than that were going on at the time, but that's what I remember about the story. So I was very curious after that and went to find the deck that was being used in that circle. And I didn't get the right thing. I actually wound up with an I Ching deck, not the same, but I'm glad that that's what I wound up with. Cause that was like way better for me personally and resonated with me personally and started experimenting with that. And it turned out anytime I brought out that deck to a circle of people guaranteed synchronicities would occur based on the cards that were drawn. <laughs> and uh, there was no stopping me from there. So divination is, is very powerful, very magical. The wrong thing never happens. And that means that the wrong card is never drawn. And you're always going to be able to infer something about the truth of yourself or universal truth, kind of the same thing by doing divination. If you're honest, it does require honesty and maybe a bit of intention, seriousness to a degree, but I digress. I digress. Uh, it's been a fun conversation with Rob. I look forward to potentially working with him again in the future as I learn more and hope you guys enjoyed it too. Don't forget. There's lots of other ways to support the podcast. Get yourself a biofield tune up. Those have just been phenomenal. They always are, but I enjoy the practice more every session that I engage in. And I feel like it gets deeper. I, I got some new forks actually from Eileen's biofield tuning store for Christmas and for my birthday. And especially the two, two, two fork is so good. I did an entire session with just that yesterday and it was awesome. Uh, biofield tuning. If you want that email me chance at interversepodcast.com or check the link in the show notes for the page on my website. that will tell you more about the process. I also recommend typical new herbs. If you want to try the herbal route for your medicinal purposes, use the interverse coupon code and get 10% off. And I'm out of here. I'm going to go enjoy the rest of my day. It's been a blast doing this podcast and I know that you guys enjoyed it too. So thanks for being here. Be good out there and I love you. Catch you on the next one. <laughs>